much of what you're going to hear at this Congress is all about the future and promising techniques and things like photon counting and all sorts of clever things that will come in the future. But what I'm going to show you now is very much a practical talk. It's using some of the very high-end technology that's available right now to change the kind of decisions you make as a clinician. Um, I'm a clinical radiologist. They, they are clinicians too. And uh, I'm just going to talk about some of the experiences we've had, particularly with um, model-based iterative reconstruction, uh, Toshiba's version. It is the first true model-based iterative reconstruction that's available for cardiac. So I'll show you some of our initial results. And it should be obvious after I've probably done this, the views I express are very much my own views and not those of Toshiba. So where do I come from? A 900 bedded general hospital, so we're a big general hospital, but we're also the regional cardiac center. So we don't have cardiac surgery on site, but we do have a very, very big cardiology unit on site. We have um, 30, 13 uh, cardiologists. They do uh, almost 3,000 PCIs a year, so it's a big cardiology center. There's 20 staff radiologists. We have three cardiac radiologists that do all of the imaging, uh, well, all of the CT and MR imaging and uh, we scan everything apart from pediatrics. So we're a big general hospital, we're not a research site. So this is the Toshiba Quillian 1 Genesis. It's a small scanner, it's got a small footprint. <coughs> it's only the same size as most 64 slices, but it's got, the big deal is it's got a big wide 16 centimeter detector so it can cover the whole heart in one heartbeat and you never need to do multi heartbeat acquisition. It's got, a, it's got the fastest rotation, 0.275, so the temporal resolution's good. And it's the two things I'm going to talk about, which are recent developments, is it's got a pure vision detector, which is very high efficiency, and it's got a new optical system called pure vision optics. So the detector, which is a very high efficiency detector, basically, theoretically, um, it would, it would uh, because it's so much more sensitive, uh, it, it should reduce your radiation dose by about 40%. Now, the surprising thing is we actually did a study, and it actually does reduce the radiation dose by 40%. We studied this on a whole bunch of patients where we, we had the luxury of having a scanner before that had the old system with the old detector, and then we had the scanner that was essentially the same, apart from it had the new, the new system. This was before the genesis. And the only difference with it was the detector. And basically, with exactly the same image quality between the two uh, patient groups, we got a 44% dose reduction. So just, just the more sensitive detector gave us a big dose reduction. And that's now standard on all of the scanners, including the Genesis. So that looked pretty good. We thought we'd you know, push the limits of dose as much as we could um, with the hardware. You know, it, it wasn't much left. But what else do you do once you've got a very efficient detector? Well, this is, a, this is something that I don't think most people have paid much attention to yet, but I think things will change. So 2017, uh, Toshiba introduced something called pure vision optics. But there are other versions of this around. So this is a generic principle. Basically, it's by having more clever filtration of the x-ray beam, you get rid of the bad photons and you have more good photons. So what you don't want in the what you don't want is low energy photons that just get absorbed in the patient's skin or in the body, but don't ever hit the detector. So you, you don't, it's the balance between getting enough you basically, the photons that come out of the tube you want that hit the patient, you want pretty much most of them to hit the detector at the other end. So it's basically by shaping the energy beam of that, of that beam so that actually the photons that hit the patient go through them and contribute to the image. Now, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but actually, in practice, it seems to be a very big deal. So what, what effect do they have? This is our own practical experience of the new system. Well, first of all, I'll... I will take you back to where we were in 2007, because it's easy to forget. You keep, you think, oh, things are, things are a little bit better than they were in 2007, but they're actually quite a lot better, certainly in our experience. This is a 16-slice retrospective gated image in 2007. I, am, I will show you this with no shame. Uh, DLP of 2,502, that's about 35 millisieverts. Now, that looks awful now, but we were all giving those kind of doses then, and we, we thought that was great, and we thought this was a good image, which is all right, it's okay, it's a, it shows LAD plaque but at about 35 millisieverts. This is the same, pa um, same patient, actually, scanned in 2017, again, but got a bit more LAD plaque now, but we've got a much better image, and DLP's 144 now. 
and a single volume. So there's basically from 2007 to 2017, and that isn't a long time, 10 years, there's been a 17 times reduction in radiation dose. And that's partly, that's, that's due to a combination of the beam, which is more cleverly filtered, and also the much more efficient detector. So those two things together, plus the wide area detector, plus the prospective gating, gives you a 17 times reduction in radiation dose and a better image. So this is, again, is the combination of the fancy detector and the new optics, i.e. the new filtration. You basically get much better stent imaging. You've got a stent here, which is actually not a, huge, not a big stent, so it's not a proximal LAD stent, it's a mid-LAD stent. So I'm not showing you just my best cases. And you can see the lumen is, is very beautifully seen on both of them. You get very little artifact. And the, the optimized beam really helps that, because basically every photon counts. You also get a slightly harder beam as well, which also helps with the uh, stents. Froze for a second. Apologies for that. This is, uh, we have electrophysiologists, and this is a left atrial planning image. We do a lot of these. So this is done at very low dose, not for coronary detail, but for left atrial and um, pulmonary venous detail. And this is a, when I say standard, that's an aquilium one with the fancy detector, single rotation. So most bell bells and whistles. And we, we thought this was great. This was a couple of years ago. We got a DLP of 44 on that patient. So that's well under a millisievert, about half a millisievert. So that's pretty good. Now, the same patient came back recently on the new system, and the only difference really between the two scanners is it's got the new optic system, and the DLP is uh, 19 now. So a, the images look pretty much the same, but you've got a, yet another big dose reduction. So we got a big reduction, sort of 40% plus, from the detector, but we got about that again from just the new optical system, the new beam filtration. So just the hardware is really, really cutting the doses down. And a DLP of 19 is, is really not going to kill anyone. So we don't do any MR planning at all for, for the left atrial planning. We've dropped MR completely, because this takes two minutes as opposed to MR, which even in the best hands, well, hopefully we are the best hands, it takes about 40 minutes. So again, this is just effect of the beam filtration. This is the um, standard system, DLP as 411 looking at the aorta, very nice views of the aorta. Again, still very nice views of the aorta, pretty much the same with someone with a stent, but the DLP is now about half. And that's just from a more clever beam filtration. So just the hardware has made that much difference. And there's no deterioration in image quality, and the spatial resolution is, in fact, slightly better, and the noise is the same. This is a patient with uh, LAD plaque. Now, this was a slight surprise to us, but it is consistent. Basically, the fact you've got more useful photons means you actually get a sharper, higher resolution image from, from basically having a more intelligent beam filtration. And, much, and you get less artifact from the calcium. You can see the calcium here on the standard system. You can see the calcium, but it's not quite as well seen as it was on the follow-up, which, which has got the more intelligent beam. And this is, I haven't said it, shown it here, but this is also at lower radiation, with the one with the new optics. So it's because there's more useful photons hitting the patient. So the, the combination of that, the fancy detector and the fancy optics means that we can scan a lot of patients now at less than a millisievert. This is a 27-year-old patient, uh, DLP of 27. The BMI was about um, tw uh, 20 here. So they, weren't, they were slim, but they weren't super thin. But we, you know, you've got 0.3 millisieverts here, and you've got a pretty nice image of the right coronary artery. A lot of you are radiologists, and not all cardiologists, so I will show some chest stuff. This is something we actually now do routinely uh, on all CTPA patients. Uh, and it was interesting to have a talk on um, pulmonary hypertension earlier. We, every single patient at our institution with a CTPA gets this. They get a pre and a post contrast image, and they get a subtracted iodine map of the lungs. And the doses we give are around a millisievert. So we do this on all comers now. And we have picked up a, a lot of cases of missed pulmonary hypertension, actually because we routinely do ID maps. Um, so this, this is, uh, actually is making a difference, certainly making a difference to diagnosis. Whether it's making a difference to outcome, I can't tell you, but we're certainly making a difference. And that's at about a millisievert. This is, this is just really how the, the very low dose changes what you do. This is an, a 21-year-old with um, that chest X-ray on the left. Someone showed that to me, and they said, what do you think of that chest X-ray? What would you do next? Shall we do a lateral? Now, 
You can do a lateral, but I am absolutely confident that a lateral is not going to answer the question here. So the fact that we can, we can do the CT at such incredibly low dose now is we've just, uh, this is heresy, I'm sorry, Chester radiologist, but I don't do laterals anymore. We do CT now because we can do it at about the same dose. And the DLP is 25, it's about 0.35 millisieverts. And you can actually see what is wrong with the patient. You've got a big fatty mass there, uh, which turned out to be a germ cell tumor. And they operated on the basis of this 0.35 millisievert image. Um, so they, they got a very quick diagnosis. So it's not just about, the, about low dose. I mean, low dose is nice, but it's basically you get much better images from this combination of a, of a better detector and a better beam. And you get much less artifacts as well. So it's not just low dose. Basically, this is a technique where you can look at, um, look at stents, where you basically do a pre-contrast image, a post-contrast image. And because we're such low dose now, the combination of those two is still around about a millisievert, just a little bit more, because the pre-contrast is very low dose. And this, this is the stent here. And then on the next image, you can see the stent's gone, and it subtracts one from the other. And we've actually found this to be quite useful, actually really definitively confirming that stents are patent, and more importantly, actually convincing the cardiologist that stents are patent, because although I can kind of feel it in my water that that stent is patent, that's a more convincing image to most inv invasive cardiologists, and that shows that that stent is okay. There's another new technique that we do, which is basically using the low dose um, in, in combat using all the low-dose techniques, for this is a new way of scanning the patients, where basically you're looking at TAVI. Now, TAVI, I don't know about the rest of you, but I don't find them very fascinating to report, but the, at least the acquisition now is easy, because we can basically do um, one acquisition with 50 mils of contrast at 80 kVp, and we can use 80 kVp because everything's so dose-efficient now. We give uh, 50 mils of contrast at three mils a second. We do a helical scan through the top of the chest. When it hits the heart, it goes to ECG gating. Then it does a very fast helical run through the rest, all in one go. A very, very quick acquisition. And uh, you get a very uh, nice image here. I'll just show you here, and it should actually move. There we go. And you get, you get basically a uh, functional image through, uh, through the heart, um, and you, get, you, you can uh, basically image the... Uh, a, the aortic orifice in both systole and diastole, and you've got all of that information for a DLP of 330 and a contrast of only 50 mils, so that's variable helical pitch. So that's a, that's a routine technique we now use for all our tabbies, and the images are always nice. It still takes a long time to report them, but the images are always nice. Let's see. When that's played, won't let me advance. Of course, we do. That's just for. It's just pretty. Uh, another new technique we've got, um, which we use with in combination with everything else, is basically the, the fact that we've got a, uh, a fancy detector and also the focus beam gives you less artifact anyway from metal than we used to ever get, and that's not a bad image there of a pacing uh, right ventricular pacing lead, but we've got something called CMAR now, which is a metal artifact reduction, which we can now use in the heart as well, which really takes, in the raw data, it takes that artifact away. It does, lots of, it does it in the raw data and does lots of clever processing to do that. And these are the kind of images you get. Now, that's, that's pretty good, I think. That's using just the filter beam and the fact that you've got a nice detector. It's a pretty good view of the RV tip. But basically, when you put the CMAR on, it takes away almost all the artifact here, and you can really see that RV tip. And, it's becoming, you know, we're, we're using it a lot for metal structures in, in the heart now and also in the chest because you really get very little artifact. You get wonderful images of the aortic valve as well. In fact, better, I would suggest, than TOE. So, but I'm not going to necessarily tell the cardiologist that yet because we can't cope with it. But you do get beautiful images of metalwork. So we've basically got a very optimized beam filtration now and a very efficient detector. And we've got high quality cardiac images. So what, what else do we want? Well. We always want more, don't we, of course? If it's good, we always want it to be a bit better. And uh, there are still some issues. You've got, we all see images a bit like this. You get calcium in the LAD. This is a pretty nice image of the LAD. Um, and the pretty nice images are stents, but you can't really see inside that second stent, even though it's quite good in the proximal stent. So we still get problems due to blooming artifact, which means you know, because of, we, we still can't see, in, in, we still haven't got as much resolution as we would like. 
And, and blooming artifact, true blooming artifact, i.e. not artifact due to motion, which I have, to, in some of the books I've seen actually it is, it is due to motion, but true blooming artifact is because of a lack of spatial resolution. So basically, if you haven't got enough pixels or voxels, you, you overestimate the, eight, the size of a structure, and that is because of lack of spatial resolution. Cath has got higher spatial resolution, so it doesn't have that problem. So, assuming we're not going to change the CT hardware, assuming we're not going to suddenly go from 0.25 millimeter detector from 0.5, how do we reduce artifacts and increase spatial resolution without increasing the dose? Well, there's basically now a true model basis for a reconstruction system that you can actually buy and is available for cardiac. And it's, got Toshi, it's Toshiba's, Toshiba's the only one at the moment, it's called First. Um, it's, in principle, it's very similar to GE's VO, which was released a few years ago, but that isn't available on their wide area detector scanner at the moment. So it's basically the way you take the detector, the detector information and transform it to an image has a huge influence on the kind of image you get. And all of the current iterative reconstruction techniques, even the ones that say model in them, are not true model-based. They've all got a bit of filter back projection in them. Now, the, this is the first one out there for the heart that actually is just model-based. It's got no filter back projection in at all. But the, the catch is, is it's very processor intensive. Until recently, it was very slow because it's so comp computationally intensive. So the principles of first or model-based, I, I won't claim to understand in detail, but basically it's able to model all of the imperfections in the scanner, essentially. It's able to model the fact that the focal spot is not infinitely small. It's able to look at the geometry of the scanner. It's able to model lots of things, and it puts all of that into the process. But it, takes a, it, it requires an enormous number of computations. In fact, as you probably a lot of you know, Godfrey Hounsfield used model-based iterative reconstruction, and it took 24 hours on the original EMI, but it was discarded because it took too long. So it looks like after all these years, the computers are now fast enough that we're back there again. So this, this takes three minutes per volume, which is obviously more than it does take for a normal reconstruction, but three minutes isn't bad. Uh, this used to be 24, 36 hours. So why does it only take three minutes per volume? Well, it's all basically clever computing. Everything these days is clever computing, and this, no, this is no exception. Basically, we've got a, um, a Cray 2 here, down the left, is uh, 1985. I don't, know whether, I don't know whether any of you remember that. I'm old enough to remember that. That was like the supercomputer of the time. That used to do the weather, it used the Pentagon have one, all the rest. That was in terms of uh, speed, which is measured in operations per second, or um, gigaflops in this case. It was 2.4 gigaflops. PS4 is 1,840 gigaflops, so it's much, obviously much more powerful than the Cray 2. But the first reconstruction box is 41,000 gigaflops, so it's equivalent to 23 PS4s, or 17,000 Cray 2s. And this is about the only time my son, who's 17, is, has been impressed with my job, is the fact that we've got the best computer that you could possibly buy. Now, all of that mega processing power, for the first time, means you can actually... Most, most systems at the moment are really good at taking noise out of the image with iterative reconstruction, but they don't give you anything extra. They don't increase anything. Now this, because this is full model based, it does increase the spatial resolution. So it doesn't just keep it the same, it increases it. And it also increases your low contrast resolution. Now that's a really big deal. So both, none of the other systems do that. The, fact, the full model based system does both of those things. So it's not just a noise reducer. It basically, it does reduce noise, but the other systems can do that. But it's, it, it's the fact that it increases the spatial resolution and it increases your low contrast resolution and it's very good at reducing artifacts. So basically it takes the nice data that I showed you before and it can make the images even better. Now this is one of our, uh, our CTPA studies. As I said, we do them all with an ID map now. This is a I deliberately showed you a very large patient. This BMI was oh, well over 30. And the, even with the pre and the post and the ID map, the DLP is 182. So it's a very good dose and you get very beautiful images. Uh, it's, we, we are learning this all the time and all my colleagues have learned this now. It's, Looking at the anatomical images is an extremely poor way of assessing clot burden, whereas an ID map it seems to be a very good way of assessing clot burden. Basically, this patient has loads and loads of wedge-shaped perfusion defects throughout both lungs, but you can only see a few of the little subsegmental emboli. So actually, the clot burden is pretty high, and that fits with the fact that actually, going back to the previous talk, the pressures in the right heart were elevated in this patient, but it's very difficult to see the emboli. 
It's dead easy to see it on the iodine map. And going back to the, you get better spatial and low contrast resolution. And this was a bit of a surprise to us, really, but I guess it shouldn't have been. This is, I make no excuses for showing you this, because a lot of you will look at chest images. This is a, this is using the model-based history of reconstruction on our genesis. And this is actually a very good 64 slice machine on the same patient. And if, if you look at the detail, look at, these, look at here the interlobular septa, you look at the emphysema here, it is very, very much superior on the model base compared with the 64 slice. And these are both half millimeter detectors. So it's almost like you suddenly went to a 0.25 millimeter detector, but without increasing the noise or increasing the dose. In fact, it's much lower dose. So this is probably the most important slide I'm going to show you with model-based. This is a deliberately very, very zoomed up image. So when you, when you zoom up, everything looks a bit blurred, but this is really zoomed up. And this is a, a nice image we've got with a good control of heart rate with someone with a bit of calcium using a hybrid iterative reconstruction. I'm not cheating. This is a hybrid iterative reconstruction. This is A to 3D, which is equivalent to uh, ACE V or whatever. So it's a hybrid iterative reconstruction technique. So it's a good one. And this is some calcium in the LAD here. That's beforehand. So if you just keep your eye on that calcium, that's the difference that model base makes. So it's suddenly you get a, a huge boost in your spatial resolution, and you can suddenly see the non-calcified plaque much better. But, but you get very, very much less blooming. And it makes it much, much easier. To, certainly uh, the big surprise we have really is it makes it really very much easier to assess patients who have a lot of calcium. We do a lot of high-risk patients, including those with typical angina, and, not, and a lot of them don't have flow-limiting disease, but it would have been difficult to tell that without the very good images. There's again another image, uh, and I can show you lots like this, but this is using basically state-of-the-art hybrid iterative reconstruction with a very fancy filter beam and a fancy detector. And you've got a quite a nice image here showing the calcium, but it looks even better with the model based here. You get much less blooming, and you can see the lumen much more confidently here. And you can much more confidently say that that is not flow-limiting. And just going back to Klaus's, to, although I've got no evidence of it yet, I would bet that, um, that any um, CTFFR would work better with these kind of images rather than the older images, because it just gives you a better image. Stent imaging, that's better as well. This again is using the sort of state-of-the-art hybrid system, but you can see much better inside the stent, particularly distally. This is exactly the same windows, I haven't cheated. Uh, but you just see much, you just get less artifact here because I've deliberately chosen a long, small stent here that isn't very CT friendly. And you can just see much better inside it using the modern based system. And that looks fine, basically. So it's all very well showing you lots of pictures and giving you lots of fancy doses and saying we did this and we did that. But what matters is does it make any difference to your practice? Does it make any difference to the answers you give? Does it make any difference to the patients? Because otherwise, it's just interesting. Well, big change to our practice is we're now quite happy to take on stents because we can see them so much better. So we've got, we've got, we get much better stent imaging, and also we've got this subtraction technique as well, and also we've got the model-based iterative recon. So we've got everything sort of going for us now, and the fact that we can, even these long, not very CT-friendly stents, using the subtraction technique, we can clear them now. Now, there, there was a problem here. You can see there's, there's stenosis, the stenosis here, the problem is distal to the stent but the actual stent itself is fine. And the, basically, we can give the interventionalist much better, more high-quality image now. And because we, it, it's, it's, not, it's not just is there a stenosis, yes or no, anymore, it's we, we can say there, is a, there are stenoses. They look definitely significant. They're more than 75%. They're distal to that stent. And they don't put them on a diagnostic list anymore. They put them on a proceed list. And they know that they are going to intervene on that, and then they pressure wire and stent at the, at the time. But it, it, diagnostic lists are gradually sliding into history. And we take a lot of high-risk patients with typical chest pain, um, and they have a lot of calcium. And we are basically able to assess the, the patients, even despite the calcium, a lot more of the time. And they're really a lot more of the time because we get a lot less blooming. And We've changed our protocol. I'm going to show you in a minute. Since we changed our protocol for assessing um, the left atrium and the pulmonary veins, no patients have had a transesophageal echo to exclude left atrial thrombus. Since so we're basically we're able to, because we can go so low dose, we're able to do sh two shots, uh, and that's an incredibly low dose. So I'll just show you the next image. This is the kind of stuff we get now. We basically get an arteriophase image which shows 
Um, I could show you a nice map of the, of the left atrium and pulmonary veins, but I won't. But we quite often get filling, lack of filling of the atrial appendage, and those patients, about 1 in 10, 1 in 20, were going for TOE. Now we do a second shot at 20 seconds, and the appendage fills. The total dose of this is 0.2 of a millisievert, and not a single patient has gone for TOE since we introduced this protocol. So there's been massive savings to cardiology. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the money yet, but I still wait. So just to sum it all up, this is my cardiac CT list from about a month ago. We just, I looked just for fun, just because I was coming here. I looked at eight patients. We use first in, every, in all the patients, we do three-phase reconstructions. In all the patients, we don't use the hybrid anymore, and it can keep up. Uh, got 100% success rate, i.e. we can see all the coronary segments in all of the patients. Mean BMI was 28, so we haven't got a thin population. Total DLP was 345. That's for all of the patients. That's not for one of them. So it's 4.8 millisieverts for all of the patients. So basically, with, with our new system, with a full model based, you can scan an entire list of patients for less than the dose of a single cardiac cath. So that's just a bit of fun, but it just shows how far we have come and how the days of diagnostic cardiac cath are numbered, I would suggest. So in conclusion, basically, Genesis is the first Toshiba scanner to in in incorporate the pure vision optics, which is a very fancy beam filtration, which I think is great and is, is a truly free lunch. And in combination with the detectors, we get even better images at really low radiation doses. First, which is the model-based system, the first one moves the game on again by you get much better spatial and contrast resolution without increasing noise and without increasing dose. And the number of not, this is the key bit really from my point of view, is the number of non-diagnostic cardiac CTs due to heavy calcium is now almost zero around our institution and our diagnostic cath rate has dropped very substantially. And I thank you for your time. <laughs>